I'm Mandy. <laughs> and I'm Rosie. And that's Rosie. <laughs> um, so we, I was waving in the beginning, but some of you couldn't see me. So um, we're going to start with a song. Thanks for joining us. And just, um, so, and if you know it, sing along if you'd like, um, just to kind of get it started with some music. And we'll be doing something with this song later on in the presentation. So feel free to send a message if the music is not clear. When the night has come. And the land is dark, and the moon is the only light you see. No, I won't be afraid. No, I, I, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. sample okay so first of all when you were listening to that song um you know a lot of things happen when music is played um these are just some of the functions of music um music can do so many things so these are just some of them um creating comfort and security energize and motivate cue relaxation response it can mask sounds in the background maybe that you don't want to hear it can reinforce behaviors or feelings, provide alternate engagement or promote active focus. It can act as an information agent. It can serve as a positive environmental stimulus, provide structure, elicit emotional responses and or memories. And I think we have a comment at the very bottom of this. So music is not a benign intervention. That's the key here. And when I was trying to pick a song to start with, I kind of um, was trying to find a benign song. But it doesn't really exist, does it? It's kind of like that song might hit someone in, in a really positive way, and it might actually bring up some memories or, or um, different kinds of emotions for someone else. So that's kind of the most important thing is that music's not benign. And it affects everybody differently. Everybody has different responses and tastes and, and choices. So, so this is just some of the goal areas. Um, this is a beautiful diagram that Rosie, I know, has used um, for a very long time, um, just kind of showing you all the different domains that music, music therapy can um, address. So you've got the physical at the top with rehab, pain management, stabilizing vital signs, relaxation, and more. Um, spiritual, hope, faith, meaning, suffering. We've got the psychological in the green, expression, mental health, self-esteem, agitation, anxiety, stress, cognition, memory, delirium. And then we have the, the circle at the bottom, the social, including relationships, communication, empowerment. And then we have something that kind of ties all of that together. So the overall goal is to just figure out what types of inter, uh, you know, uses of music, what kinds of music, what types of experiences will help to promote the wellness of the whole person and improve the quality of life. So that kind of is right in the middle. And all of those domains just kind of feed into that. So there's a lot of research on music therapy. Um, and this is just some of the research in general, what, what it has shown. Um, it can reduce anxiety, stress, insomnia, pain, nausea, and vomiting. It can improve depression, 
mood, quality of life, emotional well being, and coping, can increase comfort, promote relaxation, provide a sense of control, reduce post operative pain, lower heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate, improving immune function, supporting physical rehab, facilitating movement, increasing motivation to engage in treatment, providing emotional support for patients and their families provides an outlet for expression of feelings. And this is, um, this is just, you know, this is a pretty, pretty good list. Um, but there, you know, there are, are other things that we could put on that list. Um, and then a nice little quote, um, research indicates that music therapy is effective at reducing muscle tension and anxiety, and at promoting relaxation, verbalization, interpersonal relationships and group cohesiveness. So it's pretty powerful. So I'm going to turn it over to Rosie for one second. She's been at your medicine for a long time, and I'm going to let her tell you kind of about um, for those who are interested how um, music therapy came to be at your medicine and to bring us to the present day. So I wasn't going to talk today at all, but Mandy, I insisted, <laughs> insisted that I did. <laughs> um, so just a little history. Um, the program itself at the University of Rochester started in the medical center back in 1997 when one of the professors at Nazareth College, Dr. Brian Hunter, went on sabbatical and um, approached the hospital about starting music therapy services and went to a bunch of doors and found a pediatric oncologist who was interested, who also had interest in, at that time, alternative medicine. Um, and so they started a pilot study um, in the outpatient clinic using students, music therapists doing sessions. That led to one of the patients being admitted for a bone marrow transplant inpatient, and um, they decided to do a study. They partnered with um, Dr. Jane Liesfeld and got some great pilot data, which led to a grant proposal, which led to them finally bringing on a board certified music therapist to get that study up and running. And that was me back in 2000. Um, little did I know I'd be here today finally able to say that we're spreading much further than we were for a long time. So within that, those first 15 years, it was myself kind of building a program mostly out of pediatrics, but having this experience with adult patients from the beginning and wanting to get music to all ages because I'd seen the benefit and the value. Um, so we started an internship program, we're able to get more um, established and eventually hired a second person who served our pediatric neonatal intensive care units. And then this beautiful initiative started in 2018 called the Eastman Performing Arts Medicine Initiative. Um, there is a web website, um, feel free to take a look at it because it's it's a wonderful um, integrative collaboration of music and medicine coming together within the University of Rochester, including Eastman School of Music students coming in to perform in public spaces in the hospital. Um, and really what it also has done is enabled us to establish a music therapy program um, in not just in pediatrics, but outside. Um, so we were able to hire a, a second person up to full time, bring in a third last year, and then have been working on getting a program going in the Pluto Cancer Center. Um, actually, since before COVID, COVID kind of put a kink in some of our plans, but um, here we are this year. And Mandy is already brought on and we're working on establishing um, services here within the Integrative Oncology Center at Pluta, as well as a study that we hope to start soon uh, for women with breast cancer receiving radiation treatment at Pluta. Um, and excitingly, in a month, uh, next month in June, we will have our very first inpatient music therapist starting um, in the medical center. So lots of great things going on. And we're here to talk about the Pluta piece of it. Um, so I'm going to let Mandy go into what that might mean. Yeah, what could happen in a music therapy session? Well, so many different things. Um, and it really just starts from the, the, the person who is participating in the session. They are the center of what happens in a session. Um, I've had some patients who are really just wanting something passive. Maybe they have a favorite song that would help them relax while they're just listening. Um, so passive music listening is sometimes uh, part of what happens in a session. Active music listening can be talking about, you know, preferred songs and talking about the lyrics and why that song is preferred. Um, using certain music to assist relaxation, um, music and movement, um, creating art when you're listening to music or like music inspired art, um, doing a life review through music. And um, 
And then, you know, active music creation is when, you know, the person who is participating really just wants to be very active in the session. And that can include maybe they've always wanted to learn an instrument, um, singing, improvisation, songwriting. Um, I mean, the main thing is that it's really just you can go in with a plan when you're first meeting somebody, but it's really just kind of the plan is created around the person, um, created around their preferred music, their preferred instruments, kind of how they're feeling that day, and it's always different. Um, so yeah, so symptom management and procedural support, basically that would look like um, doing an initial assessment, um, and then from that assessment, kind of figuring out what the plan would be going forward. Um, and the plan would include different goals and objectives for that particular person. Um, and some different evidence-based practice, we have some, some terms up here that are um, kind of, we, we use them uh, sometimes in different interventions. So entrainment is something that, um, that really, that I've used a few times with a few patients. And I, I think I first heard about entrainment from Rosie actually. Um, and basically it's, it's when you're using a song and you kind of just uh, thin it out as you go along and help the, the person kind of just melt away into a relaxed state. Um, so one song that we've done that with is actually the same song that we started with, but I changed because of Rosie's suggestions, changed a few elements in that song to make it sound very different. And here's like what an example could sound like if we use that same song, but using it for an entrainment experience. So as you kind of go through an entrainment experience, you might just kind of uh, thin it out even more, leave out more words, and just kind of um, support the breathing rate of that patient as they try to relax, for example. Um, ISO principle, that is something that basically, um, ISO means same. Um, and I have found that ISO principle is a really important principle to use in music therapy. However, I have found I have certain clients that are actually the opposite of that. Have you found that you've met people that so ISO principle basically means that, um, you know, an example I, I can use in my own experience in my my own world is if you're waking up really early in the morning and you're kind of groggy and you're not quite awake yet. You don't want someone coming in going good morning, good morning, um, because it might be agitating. Um, so the ISO principle kind of is uh, meeting the person who's participating in the session at their level, at their mood, at their breathing rate, um, and kind of using experiences together to, to move elsewhere or support, you know, if that's what's needed and then move elsewhere. 
Um, so yeah, but I do have some clients who, if they're feeling really low or if they're feeling really angry, if you put on a happy song, it just, it kind of flips the switch for them. Yeah. So that kind of is another, you know, another thing to consider. The gate control theory of pain, um, basically, if there is a stimulus such as music um, being presented, it blocks other stimulus that's going to the brain, such as pain. So, um, you know, you could, you could use uh, music to support things that are painful, turn up the volume, add more stimulus of music, and the more pain there is, the more volume, and it kind of helps block the pain. Um, identifying positive coping skills through music. Um, so, yeah, basically practice uh, and model behaviors through musical cues. There's a lot you can do with that too. So, um, yeah, so developing and promoting positive coping skills. This can assist with self-expression, the life soundtrack. I think you've done that with a lot of your patients. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of creating a soundtrack of, um, you know, a long list of, of songs that perhaps represent your life um, and kind of putting it all onto one album. Um, lyric discussion, uh, songwriting, creating an art response to music, which looks like that lovely <laughs> piece that's of a lyric collage. Yeah, yeah. lyric collage. Yeah. Uh, no, that's the lyric collage. Yeah. That's the next one. Yep. Um, exploring and developing and refining musical coping skills, um, playing a familiar instrument, learning a new instrument, singing, improvising, and music assisted relaxation. So, I'm going to hand it over to Rosie again. I kind of insisted that she talk about this one too, because I think it's such a great example of somebody who used, um, one of the things I want to say real quick is, first of all, you need zero musical skills and zero lyrical writing skills to participate and get a huge benefit from music therapy. In fact, most of our clients are not musicians. I mean, we occasionally run into people who are musicians or have a musical background, but um, but I don't know what the background is in terms of musicality for this particular patient, but it's an example of one of her patients that used his own experience to write a song. Yes. So actually, um, this, this particular patient was someone I worked with back when I was working on the bone marrow transplant unit. He was a 54-year-old male um, diagnosed with multiple myeloma, and he was admitted to get um, a bone marrow transplant using his own cells. And the goal of that study was relaxation. So often I would go in the room and um, do some guided imagery, maybe breathing to music, progressive muscle relaxation to help with some of his goals, which included decreasing his nausea and anxiety. Um, but he also really, really, really loved the blues. And we talk, so we talk about music and we work more on some of his goals of self-expression um, and developing those coping skills because by day 11, he was feeling a little flustered, just wanted to go home, wanted his counts to come back. It was the lowest point of the transplant for him at that point. He just didn't feel great. And so we, we did some songwriting. He himself was not um, somebody who had ever written a song or played an instrument or sang, um, but we talked about what the blues meant to him and what he might want to express. And so within that session, he wrote these lyrics. I'm sorry, not within that session. After I left the room, he wrote these lyrics, and then I came back the next day and we were able to set it to music. Um, so I will sing for you. He did actually sing it with me in the moment, but we did not record it. His wife was able to hear it, and that's the person he wanted to hear it the most, um, as well as his doctor who came in the room and a couple of residents. Um, so imagine I am a 54-year-old man at this point. <laughs> Those no count blues, the kind when your blood's gone away. Yeah, I got those no count blues. Sure hope it ain't gonna stay. Can't chase me no women, not the way I feel today. Starts in the morning, I heave so hard till you're wrecked. Get some good meds real quick that makes you feel much better. This can't go on forever, or I'll be less than 100 cents. 
One day my counts will come back, won't have to keep paying those dues. I know it won't be long now, now the docs will see it too. Get your life together and stop singing the no pound blues. And actually, <laughs> his counts came back that next day. They did. <laughs> so his, That's his amazing. Came true. It was great. That's amazing. Yeah. So, social support. So here's some feedback, some from previous groups, music therapy groups. Yes. Yeah, so we um, were fortunate to have uh, our interns get to do projects within their internship experience, and so we did pilot a group over at what was then called Gilda's Club. Um, working is in the, the context of a, we called it a survivor choir. So any person that had an, at any stage of cancer could participate in the choir. And it was more than just a choir, it was also a support group. So the participants would come and bring songs that they felt um, connected to and wanted to process with the group. And then the group would sing the song together. And so after an eight week um, group kind of journey, they did a concert for their loved ones of the three songs that they picked to perform. And then we had some exit surveys. And so these were from those exit surveys asking what was most helpful um, for the people that participated. And it was sharing of stories and feelings, that feeling of openness, um, being able to pick a song that meant a lot to them and or related to my personal experiences with cancer and other issues. Um, and they all were interested in not only continuing to receive music therapy, but would recommend it to others. So with that feedback, I knew we wanted to have more programming available for people going through cancer. Some of our favorite quotes from different people. Um, Oliver Sacks, I have to single out our music therapist with whom I've had the closest relation for music has been the profoundest non-chemical medication for our patients. Um, and, you know, once again, kind of supporting the idea that music is not benign. It's just not, so, yeah. I think I also, before we end, can you talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing at? Pluto? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was going to, yes, okay. So, I mean, what I'm going to be doing at Pluta is um, I'm going to be providing uh, music therapy for patients and hopefully uh, family and caregivers who are interested, um, both in individual and group settings, um, based on um, the need and the desire of those, of those people. 